Great, welcome everybody. Um, I'm uh, talking to you from the United Lounge. I'm on my way to London. I'll be at, um, out on PTO for the for the rest of next week, attending a wedding. But um, so delighted that I could get through uh, boarding uh, or get through uh, passport control and so on, and, and get to, uh, um, to to join the call today. Great to see so many um, faces and so many new faces as well. Um, the organization is six weeks old, and we are gathered here, um, all motivated by the similar sort of angst, a broad angst. We feel that AI is heading in a in a dangerous direction, in an unsafe direction, and needs to be steered onto a path that's more aligned with human values. <clears throat> So that's a bold, ambitious mission for um, a, a young volunteer organization. But hey, how hard can it be? Um, so look, there's, there's hours and hours of video material online where we talk about what the Kwai um, mission is. And um, we are in a phase where we are building a movement. Um, we, we really don't have a, a solid plan. So that's, let's be honest about it. We don't have a solid plan, but we, we have got a broad idea that um, there needs to be the equivalent of the Linux of AI. Um, AI is currently controlled by maybe a half a dozen very large deep pocketed companies whose, whose motivations aren't necessarily aligned with um, the common good. Um, so it, a non-aligned movement, it would take a non-aligned movement that is not misaligned, um, one that um, is uh, aiming to democratize AI. And so I'm glad you're all on board. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, those of you that just want to be observers, that's fantastic. This is a public meeting. Um, those of you that can contribute um, more than eight hours um, a month, that's not a lot. Um, please join up as a volunteer if you've not filled in the form on the quai.ai website then please do so um, you'll be added to the slack channel and so you can participate in the discussion um, beyond just this call once a week and help us move our founding documents further and then if you fancy yourself as a um, a, a key stakeholder or a key voice in AI, then consider becoming a member of the advisory board. And uh, we've got some um, deep minds and heavy hitters on the advisory board already, but we we welcome more. So uh, with that, that, I hope that stands for a, a welcome message that uh, Afshin would have made. Um, uh, I'll hand it back to you, Matt, to continue the agenda. Sorry, I'll, sorry, I just want to say thanks. I was running late from another meeting, so. <laughs> oh, there we go. Thanks so much, Afshin. I, I hope I stood in for you there. Wonderful. Th thank you, Reza. And uh, you're you're actually next up on the agenda. If you've got any updates, Gosh. kind of week over week further, uh, yeah. I, I we can uh, kick it over to Mike. Yeah. Oh, so so updates for the week. Um, uh, some fantastic meetings. Okay. So let me, let me report on some of them. Um, Ruth and I met with the um, the. Uh, VP of instruction at the College of the Canyons. So this is a this is a college where Ruth is professor of English, um, and I thought it'd be great to have an affiliation with a college. We've we've got promises or early discussions of an affiliation with USC. That's where I gave the original keynote, where, which where we launched Quai. Um, but uh, a more concrete. Um, uh, um, affiliation could be with the College of the Canyons, especially as we're going to ask them to host our first summit. So um, College of the Canyons is conveniently located 25 minutes north of Burbank Airport. So for people to come in into the LA region, you don't have to put up with LAX, where I am now. Um, but uh, they also very enthusiastic and very forward thinking about AI in education. So there's a whole track that Ruth and Ronaldo uh, are starting to talk about, about an education track. And so this resonated with um, 
the, the college administration. And um, there's a very good chance that they'll agree to host us, uh, host our, our summit in sort of mid-October. I think October 14 is looking like a possible date. So that, that's one thing we should put a pin in that. Um, a couple of key meetings I met with Victor Harwood of Digital Hollywood. A few of you on the call know him. He's a, he's a big name in this town. In, in term, he runs the, um, the conference and he's been running this for, gosh, maybe 20 years. The conference is called Digital Hollywood. And um, the whole mission of Kwai around um, individuals owning their own co-pilot, owning their own tools of the trade, is the thing that's actually playing out in the Hollywood strikes now. So it's a clear and present danger that's understood by that community. And it's our thesis that, it's, that this will come for every single job unless the Less is some sort of altruistic intervention. Anyway, the, the idea resonated really well with um, Victor Harwood. He wants us to make a proposal. Um, it could simply be maybe a moderating a panel, or it could be an entire track around democratizing AI. And that's what I think we should do. He, his conferences run a couple of times a year, and he's also co-located um, his conference with CES. So that's a fantastic venue. And um, that could also be a big amplification. Okay, so put, let's put a pin in that one. I got a, an email from um, Scale. Scale is the Linux developer um, conference. Um, and they have, uh, their, their, their board is green lit that why should participate in the uh, um, developer conference in March of next year. It's in Pasadena, so another one in the sort of greater LA region. And um, I think that'll be a fantastic opportunity. There's a keynote um, slot available. We just need to make a proposal, and it could be an entire track as well of, um, uh, of their conference. So... Um, exciting amplification of a frankly a very small voice we we're only a few people a couple of dozen maybe three dozen people and we're starting to make a noise um there's some other meetings that are off the public agenda but they're more about enterprise um potential enterprise uh first members and um i'm still hoping to land our first enterprise member um by the end of this quarter and uh, the goal is for five by the end of Q4. So those those are ambitious goals. I think. Um, uh, okay, now I'm now I'm rattling on. I'm going to hand back to Matt. Those are awesome updates, uh, Riza. Thank you. Uh, excited that uh, we'll also have an opportunity to come together in October, uh, meet each other in three dimensions. Uh, those of us that haven't met before. Uh, excellent. Uh, great. Uh, so. You know, we're kicking off a little bit of a an opportunity here. Uh, this is for members uh, and advisors alike. Um, if you would like to kind of present a lightning talk at one of these weekly public meetings about you know your passion area, your focus, uh, and what it is that you know you think can help drive the Quai vision forward, uh, we'd love to invite you. So you know, I, I'm really pleased to uh, invite Mike up to to do the first one uh, about personal AI and self sovereign identity. Thanks, Matt. Sorry, I realized my microphone's muted. Um, a quick update, um, and then I'll jump into personal AI, just tagging on some of the activities that Rose has been involved with. Um, I, too, had a, a meeting this week uh, related to a pretty powerful group of um, family offices. Uh, they hold an annual conference. I mentioned a little bit about this, I think, on the meeting last week. But I actually met with them this week, uh, presented information on personal AI, which I'll talk about in a second, as well as some of the things that we're aiming to do with Quai. Um, and the net result is, um, now I don't know why they have to check their budget. They're literally the 100 wealthiest family offices in the world. 
but uh, it is being held in Lisbon, and so you know they they are checking, um, make sure that they can afford to travel me out there. Um, and if that's the case, then I will be presenting um, to that conference as a keynote uh, on both of those topics. And that that happens, I believe it's um, early in November, in the first or second week in November. So it gives us some time to continue to put meat on the bones, um, as they say, um, ahead of that. Now, I really don't know what will come out of it, uh, but as I uh, discussed it with Reza uh, privately, <laughs> It's a little bit like, because I did present um, a keynote on the metaverse last year at that conference, and it's a little bit like the meeting of the Illuminati. That's about the only way I can describe it. Um, it it's very private, very secretive, um, and very guarded, but um, a group of very, very powerful people. Um, so um, with with that in mind, uh, oh, I see there's another conference in Lisbon. Oh, maybe I could stick around for that too if, um, and present if there's opportunities. Um, so um, I, I just I wanted to bring the group up to speed on some conversations that were happening in the Slack advisor um, channel. And really, I, I don't really have a formalized talk here. So I just want to kind of um, uh, tell you a little bit about where, where my head's at and see if it resonates with anyone else. But, you know, as I've been involved in these meetings, um, it, it, it kind of dawned on me that, you know, in some ways, AI is a boil the ocean um activity um and very much the focus uh, of our group seems to be lending itself in a direction related to what i'll just simplify um and call your co-pilot so this idea that ai is intelligent and follows you and helps you uh versus a lot of the other application spaces for ai now there might be policies and other things that we want to be more broad but from a sort of focus standpoint, it feels like that's kind of where this is coalescing. Uh, and one of the challenges I've been personally having is, is how do you frame that? How do you frame that in a way that's easily understood, that has the potential to, um, to very quickly coalesce around something specific? So individuals, organizations, even some of the big players in AI today have a very focused understanding of what it is that this group is, is aiming to do. And it kind of dawned on me that we're, we're sort of in the very, very same point in time, if you look at it and abstract it out, as when there used to be mini computers and mainframes, and the only way you could get compute power was to access it that way. And AI is kind of built that way right now. It's built in these clouds. It's built as a service that can be accessed, but you can't own necessarily what's going on there. And then there was the dawn of the personal computer era, which basically low cost processors and readily available operating systems and then GUIs and all sorts of things that made it more accessible allowed individuals to have their own computer, whether it was at work or whether it was at home and empowered all sorts of new personal applications for computing. And if you really abstract out what AI is, it's a computer. I mean, it's a very specific type of computer. It's not hard, it's not the way we think of a computer, but it kind of is. Um, and what are we really trying to do with a co-pilot is create personal AI, is create your personal computer that is intelligent, that follows you around that knows your persona, that captures the way you think, that captures your interactions, and then develops smarter solutions for you in the tasks that you are doing. Um, and that, that to me is, is um, not much different than something calling something a co-pilot, but it's broader in that it takes a stake that we're creating a new type of industry. And this is a nonprofit organization that's helping to define those standards, provide some of the initial toolkits to get an entire ecosystem to build around it. Um, and, and so the idea of calling something personal AI, and by the way, I'm not married to the actual term, but I like it directionally, um, really makes it very simple for people to understand. It creates the boundaries by which we sort of present ourselves um, and helps us coalesce in a very focused direction. 
fundamental to that is kind of the second to topic around personal AI, which is personal AI can only be personal AI if you own your identifier that allows you to capture and record and have complete ownership and control over all that information um, and all the tuning that that might that that information might be doing to large language models or other parts of the, the AI stack. Um, and so with that, um, I um, I think I may have mentioned on the call last week, but uh, Reza and I also talked about it, which is um, I've been very passionate about the self-sovereign identity space for the last eight years um, and um, had been primarily focused, our company's primarily been focused on it related to the metaverse. So the idea that self-sovereign ID is, is intelligent and interactive. Um, and in the interactive pieces are actions and visualizations. But I think for our purposes, there is a partition of our technology that we'd be willing to contribute um, to the organization that would allow for freely available instantly accessible any user can do it create their own self-sovereign personal ai id um, and, and that would be a way to get the ball rolling on this idea of the very bottom of the stack for personal ai being your self-sovereign id and a bunch of apis and open tools that allow anybody to develop value-added services and systems, whether it's our co-pilot that we may want to do in this organization or anybody else's co-pilots or other applications or plugins that would be involved, uh, to start to build a user base um, that would allow for an installed base for developers to want to build um, into this ecosystem um, and propagate it as a standard. So. Um, that that's really kind of the genesis of the of the discussion, and you know, I haven't prepared anything more formal than that. Uh, but but I just wanted to kind of socialize it um, and maybe stimulate some discussion uh, or questions um, uh, in this meeting, and you know, see how we kind of take it from here. Awesome, Th thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. And uh, yeah, let's open it up for questions. Uh, if anybody has some feedback or thoughts, uh, you know, please use the hand raise there. Kai. Yes, hi, uh, everybody. Uh, three points. Um, first of all, uh, your remark, Reza, about saying that, um, yeah, we don't have a clear uh, plan and so on. And actually, it's very powerful because even though we don't have a clear plan, uh there are so many interests which means that underneath of that there is something more fundamental than when you define a clear goal so it's easy for people to follow but without a clear goal people just feel it which means that it's much more profound the second comment uh, i want to say is um personal ai is a very interesting concept and um uh, by by using the metaphor right of the pc pers uh, personalized computer um what we realize is <laughs> as you can see how much companies today try to uh, get to the information on social media and so on so imagine once you have a personal ai which is much deeper than just you know your your nickname, where you are living, what you like, don't like. What I mean by that is we have to have a, a, a session really thinking about the security of this personal AI. Because trust me, people are going to try to to hack it a uh, thousand times more than what it is today. So without this uh, security, there will no personal AI uh, because it's going to be rapidly uh, destroyed. And the last point, um, and I mentioned that last time, and it's still something I think it's important, is that we, we, it's very important we are inclusive, including the big company, the richest people, we have to define a way that they can find this is beneficial for everybody. We are not, you know, us versus them, in particular, when we want them to be members and so on. 
So uh, we have to dig deeper into our message um, uh, rather than versus. It's more how together as, a, as humanity, we can everybody benefit from it at, at different level. I think those are really good points, Guy. You know, one of the things, uh, uh, just a couple of them, yeah, some of my thoughts. Um, one is um, what I didn't mention because I didn't want to get too deep into it is the self sovereign ID technology is tokenized on a digital ledger, it's tokenized on a blockchain, um, which provides public key, private key security and authentication. Um, and the, the, some of the IP that we have and the way that you create your ID causes you to be authenticated as an individual, not at the level of uh, KYC. <laughs> You're not gonna have to put a passport or anything like that, but there are some basic assumptions um, around how we eliminate bots and all sorts of things that people are real humans. And if they own the device, and they're being authenticated on that device, there's at least a, a, a working assumption that it's theirs, right? Um, and that's them. Uh, so, um, and, and there's lots of technology solutions to be integrated that, that can take care of that. I, that that's it's not like invention. Um, so um, in, in the world that I'm imagining, if you play out, um, what happens is when you create your authenticated self-sovereign a, you know, personal AI, your AI ID, um, you get the equivalent of a blue check mark that, you know, like in social media, you're authenticated. Any information that you do plan on sharing carries that certificate of authentication. So imagine a world where your co pilot is scanning all of your emails and developing responses to those emails but it's developing it in your personal AI voice, right? I don't mean actual audio voice, but but in your written voice, like I would write an email differently than you would, Kai, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure of it, even if the main content was the same and people would know whether it was coming from you or coming from me. So that is a powerful application that is likely going to occur. Um, and in that case, along with that email, if you choose to, to send what your personal AI is writing, would be kind of the check mark that kind of says this authentically came from you know kai and you click through on the check mark and you can see it on an explorer of the digital ledger that that is you so, so there are ways to kind of build that authentication and registry and understanding um of who's what which you know is part of what we were developing for the metaverse because it becomes even a little scarier when it's more than written and it's actual um pretty photorealistic representations of people um, in immersive worlds. Um, but with that said, um, I think your points are extremely on point and valid. Um, and in addition to that, one of the reasons why I believe one of the most important deliverables this group needs to have is a point of view on what the AI stack looks like very much like the networking stack. Like we understand, you know, layer one, layer two, we understand the networking stack and we understand where in which people can contribute and have opportunities to participate. I think if we develop that stack, we're going to be able to identify the ways in which our point of view is working such that it is a big tent. It does allow for everyone to participate. There's known hooks that big tech that's already very uh, well under their way in AI can see how this fits in with their strategies. Um, and, and I think without something somewhat specific like that, it becomes a little ethereal. Um, and um, I think having that point of view on a stack is going to help us, um, especially in some of our initial communications to get the right kind of participation and membership. Um, so I'll just kind of throw those things out for ideas and thoughts as well. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, we're, we're running a bit long. Uh, Reynaldo, you've had your uh, your hand up there. We are certainly getting into some of the advisor roundtable, you know, uh, topical areas. So, uh, Reynaldo, uh, you have one here? Yeah, yeah. I want to talk about the concept, expand the concept of so sovereignty, because sovereignty extends to this, not only the self, but also the family. So you have sovereignty 
uh, rules within the family. You have sovereignty rules within the community. So it's really sovereignty is a layered concept that could be applied architecturally to the stack that we were talking about, because knowledge isn't just within the self. You have you you should have the ability to share it with your family, share it with the community, and vice versa. You need to be able to to share knowledge in a structured way, uh, policy driven way with other groups in, as part of the community and sovereignty also the concept that applies to ip intellectual property rules there's national you know most of the ip rules deal with national sovereignty rights around ip and so on so i think that that concept of sovereignty has to be pegged to the way that intellectual property is managed you know on a global scale so that those are my initial thoughts awesome Th thank you for that, Ronaldo. Uh, you know, the, the layers of the stack uh, will be some great uh, further discussion. Please join in the virtual Slack members, you know, add your uh, add your thoughts here. There's a self-sovereign ID uh, channel here uh, to come and talk about this. Uh, there's a policy channel and other uh, topical areas. So please help us get the, uh, the digital community going there uh, and keep this conversation going. Uh, we'll move on here uh, to just the advisor round table uh, section here we're certainly uh bleeding over uh into some of these topical areas this is just an opportunity to discuss a few uh, areas of business uh advisors if you would uh you know like to you know come off uh, uh come off mute come on video uh and you know what we are really looking to talk about today is the organizational structure and kind of the governance to get us started and mike leaned into this a little bit with the uh, dao structure uh the distributed autonomous organization mike uh, do you want to say a few words just about that concept as applied to how it might you know help us operate uh, as a group uh sure absolutely yeah one thing i i, I can share more broadly but i shared it it's public uh, i shared it out in the advisor channel is um we, we we were playing something very similar to this in the metaverse space for an open metaverse so there is a structure that already has been defined that um, is is very dense, takes time to read and digest, um, probably not something I could cover in just a few minutes here. But there's a white paper that I'm happy to share a link out to you um, where people can get you know a little more depth of understanding. But what I've always thought one of the huge applications for the idea of tokens on a blockchain um, beyond what they've been sold as um, in nefarious ways, quite honestly, is that it's really a way to build communities. Um, and one of the big communities that can be built are things like this, working groups um, and organizations where everyone has a common set, a common stake, and a common you know, one stake, one vote um, orientation. So a, a DAO, um, if, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, is basically um, a decentralized autonomous organization. Sounds really fancy, um, but it, it just think of it as as if we wanted to create this as a country with its own currency. And whether that currency has its own value or not doesn't really matter. The currency is to bind you um, in as a group to have a common stake. Um, and on top of it, it creates a set of democratized governance principles um, that allows the entire community to vote um, as uh, we put forth different kinds of proposals. Anyone can put forth proposals and um, the group then, you know, can desire, decide and vote based off of, you know, staking their tokens and other things that, um, that are involved in it. The, the big advantage is, um, you know, in the past, a working group like this, and, and even the way, you know, Linux, although it did get a lot of participation, um, it's not always clear what you might get in return for your contributions. Um, some of that, you know, can happen just as like altruistically. Um, but whenever you get organizations involved, like we're going to have companies involved at some point and they're going to have agendas and their influence can be outsized um, to individuals. And one of the benefits of a DAO is it does kind of create the same 
well, this is a dirty word, but the same kind of voting system that you might have in a democracy uh, when, when working properly, um, where literally um, your authenticated self-sovereign ID entitles you to be part of the group. It entitles you to have a one vote that's just as equal as anyone else's vote um, and the ability to actively participate. There's possibility that those tokens could end up on exchanges and have value and and so your contributions could be recognized and we could create pools of tokens um, that automatically get distributed based off contributions of members um, and all sorts of great things. Uh, so like the voting and staking tokens are separate from sort of like tokens that you might earn for, for activities. Uh, so, so that's a lot of information in a little bit of time and I probably could go on for hours. So um, I'll just kind of start it there and happy to answer any questions or um, stimulate other discussion. Yeah, great. Tim, Tim, you had your uh, hand up here. I hadn't heard from you yet. Is that working? There we go. Hey, uh, good morning. Um, I kind of think of like when we were doing the Kronos Group OpenXR initiative, there's the whole Kronos Group and um, and what's in the initiative for OpenXR was specific to basically make it ubiquitous so you could track the head tracking and stuff for uh, VR headsets. For, with this group, I'm trying to go, what is our like one minute sizzle reel that I go in and watch when I go to the web page? And what's the visual graphic of like somebody's day part and watching me wake up in the morning, checking my email, going to Facebook, and then seeing all my data being abused, sucked in, enriched, and then sold to advertisers, um, to me walking down the street to go get a coffee on my mobile device, and Google's tracking my GPS. So I'm thinking of like, do people, what's a powerful message visually that shows throughout my day part, throughout my week part, all of my data being aggregated and sold? Where does it go? And then what does it look like in the future where I control my data, where I'm trying to keep as much stuff off of the network as possible? Because anytime I use a phone and it goes to a cell phone, it's being sold and enriched. And so I'm trying to understand, like, what is the core concept of this and how to use graphics to tell that story and then crunch it down to a one minute video. And then within that one minute video, we have domain experts who are experts at different parts of the stack. And how can you tie that together so people can visualize it? Because if you can't, if we, we need to visualize it so you can get people on board. And then it also creates a mini conference because we can talk about each part of the stack and scenarios and then go down the rabbit hole for each part of the, kind of call it the bad guy, right? I want to use my phone, but I don't want my, Jeep, my, my cell phone tracked and I see my stuff on Google Maps and God, they have everything I, you know, I went here, I went to the bathroom for two minutes. They know, I mean, they can tell if they can extract a lot. So that's kind of my thoughts is how do we get down to brass tacks um, and package it? That makes sense. I think this uh, certainly leads into some of the advisor work groups. Uh, Afshin, did you want to share something here? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was just want to expand on what Mike said, and then Tim brought up good points too. You know, I think one thing was uh, you brought up the subgroups, right? And that's I think key. Like I think the way to maybe get people involved that, um, as Mike was going off to get the investment. Like you know, some of the groups I've led or I do lead, uh, what happens is then people just they're within the main part of the group, but then they would branch off and work on some specific thing related to the you know overall agenda of the, of the main group like i know we've talked on the slack back and forth about some of these subgroups but like one subgroup could be purely in, in, in involved with what this tim said you know making sure you know this doesn't get out of hand and then you know that they won't track you and make sure all the safety and one group could be in charge of ai ethics and i think if we start branching people off that way then people could run off throughout the week have like you know once a week have meetings by themselves and then come back to this main meeting hey we've done this this week We've solved this problem and we solved Tim's uh, problem that he's saying is an issue, which it obviously will be, you know. So I think that maybe something like that might be a good idea to try to start sooner than later, you know, because then people could start really getting their feet wet and their fingers actually literally wet, you know, writing, writing protocols, writing, you know, whatever we need to write, you know, to get this moving on and getting people um, on board. 
Yeah, great, great points, Afshin. And, you know, we're, we're certainly hitting time, uh, you know, for the for the opportunity to discuss this. But that's a great segue, you know, to the member voices here. Uh, members, if uh, if you've got questions, comments, feedback, you know, opinions about uh, what you've heard today, you know, please raise your hand. We'll try to uh, answer uh, first with folks that haven't had an opportunity to share. Uh, and then uh, uh, open that up uh, for others as well. Um, uh, Kai, you also had your hand up. I know you, let's continue the conversation going, uh, but before we did that, I just wanted to make a quick announcement uh, related to uh, the advisor work groups as well as the, the QI mission. Uh, the QI mission, which we said was going to be uh, you know, shared out uh, it's it's finally ready. Uh, so, you know, members, please expect uh, comment access to a Google Doc uh, immediately, you know, following the weekly public meeting. Uh, please get in there, uh, have a read, uh, make a comment, uh, add your opinion. Uh, you know, this this is really what's needed at this point. You know, let's uh, let's open the floodgates of opinions and thought uh, and start organizing it together. So. Uh, please do that uh, and uh, expect that to be shared hereafter. Uh, if you're an observer, you'll get viewer access to this. We're going to put this, uh, eventually put this up on the website as well, uh, broadly to the public, uh, but we certainly want to give folks an opportunity uh, to share and contribute first. Uh, so with that, I'll kick it back over to uh, Kai. Kai, did you have a comment here? Uh, yeah, a very quick uh, point. Uh, one related to the blockchain you mentioned, Mike, and this is very important. And I, I don't see blockchain just in terms of how we protect to be, if I may say, invaded, but uh, on the other way around that keep people responsible about their own personal AI. So uh, this is the problem we have today in our society, right? People can say and express whatever, and, and we don't even know if they are real or not, and so on. So blockchain can be used in this case to, um, to make us more responsible of our actions. And, and I think this can be one thing. The second thing is when we talk about sovereignty, uh, sovereignty for personal sovereignty is, is very important. Now, when we talk about group sovereignty, we have to be very careful. Uh, a nation, uh, a war exists because we have nations. So uh, it, there are always, you know, the pro and cons on, 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 on things. So maybe we should think about how to uh, change or extend the notion of sovereignty that is inclusive and not exclusive. And the soonest it's exclusive is where you start to have conflict. And then the last point, uh, Tim, when you talk about uh, uh, the um, uh, to, to, to be tracked, um, you know, I'm a radical optimistic person because I'm an entrepreneur, right? But I'm pessimist on that, which means that we will be hacked, we will be tracked. Uh, and, and there are so many smart people that will work on it. So we have to take that as an as a, as a assumption that we will be. So then from there, what we can do about it. Um, so, yeah, this was a, yeah, my comment. Especially as people are getting older, like my stepmom in Hawaii just got hacked. And I mean, then my mom had her personal and at the club and by two seconds the russian mafia literally went to nordstrom put 10 grand on the card and like in six seconds and now with all these ai tools it's like you can mimic someone's voice i can ma i can match your style of i can make a video with you it's gonna get crazy great uh, great points thank you um members uh would any of you like to introduce yourself if you're new today uh you haven't had an opportunity to share why it, what uh, prompted you to join today's call please uh, please raise your hand I, I won't put you on the spot great graham volunteering all right my name is graham moorhead i am an adjunct professor at gonzaga i teach ai um toby invited me thank you toby um this is a great group doing something very important we're all part of something very huge that's happening to humanity. I think about in 1899, you could be a company and still not be using electricity. But by 1999, that was unfathomable. Same thing's happening to AI this century. And I think if we play our cards right, everybody can be a part of this. 
training AI could be a blue collar job. But I, I love all the things you're thinking about. And I think the alignment problem is an engineering problem. But we got to figure out what are, what's the taxonomy? How do we talk about this? How do we put this into documents in a way that we can all agree on it and figure this out? Thank you. Good to be here. Fascinating, Graham. Thank you. Uh, Doc uh, Searles, please. Hey, um, uh, Toby sent me as well. Um, and uh, it's good to be here. Knew nothing about it before I talked to him a couple of days ago. Uh, and just uh, applied a few minutes ago, uh, right at right at one o'clock. Um, I'm I'm all over this as a topic, um, and uh, it's close to pretty much all of the work that I've been doing to you know empower individuals and uh, distribute power and make the internet what it was supposed to be in the first place, which is a peer to peer um, system. Um, I think that you know. We are, and this is just my opinion, that we are at a moment right now that reminds me a bit being old. I can remember this. Um, like personal computing was in, say, 1973 or 74. It was almost unthinkable. We should have our own AIs, I, I believe. We should have our own way to, to improve our lives for ourselves. And it's kind of like personal computing was an oxymoron in 1973. And 10 years later, we had it. I think we should have it with this as well. In the meantime, I think fighting, fighting this battle um, is uphill in the sense that we, in like 1995, decided that client-server was the way to organize the web. Um, client-server, I've been told, it may be apocryphal, it may not, was a euphemism for slave-master. And we took something that was inherently a, an egalitarian protocol, TCP IP, and for that matter, HTTP as well, and, and turn it into something where we are always at the mercy of, um, of others uh, that are more powerful than we are. We built, we provisioned asymmetrical um, DSL, ADSL, that's the DSL we had. Cable is the same way. I'm talking to you on a, a connection that's a gigabit down and, you know, 30 megs up. Um, I can't run a server here. I did run a servers when in 1995 through late nineties and that went away as an option. Um, and we, we kind of gave away the power that we had a long time ago. We need to get it back, but it's very hard to think outside the box that we are always at the mercy of the platforms and the clouds and the large entities that can afford to buy a billion dollars worth of NVIDIA chips and the rest of it. Um, and I think we're going to be fighting that uphill for a little while, but we still have the models um, at our base to work with. So I'm optimistic at that level. Awesome. Th thank you, Doc. Great introduction. Appreciate that. Uh, Shad. Yeah. Hello. Good morning. Um, my name is Shad Nigren. Um, I uh, saw Reza at Datacon LA, so that's kind of how I learned about this. Uh, my background is in uh, computer science, um, programming, uh, cloud, um, doing doing AI, ML type stuff, data science and, and NLP and stuff like that. Um, I got into um, using ChatGPT in December of last year and I was just blown away by, by what it could do. And, and I started using it for a lot of different things. I was working with some uh, realtors and, and help them to be able to take some, some real estate listings, some, some draft stuff that they had written. And I was just amazed at how good chat GPT could, you know, turn that into some, some really good real estate listings. Um, I also happen to be taking some courses. Uh, I was taking a quantum computing course. So I've got a background in, in bioinformatics and quantum computing. And I was, um, taking that and, and I, with, with MIT and I, and I was using it in, I was just amazed at how, how in depth I could, have conversations with it about about the um, the the scientific papers and how well it was doing it at being able to help me answer test questions. Um, if you've done any programming, you know you may know that ChatGPT can do like you know programming of Python and stuff. Well, it can also do quantum computing languages, and I was just blown away by by what it could do. Um, but then I realized as as we moved from three point five to to four, that it seemed to get dumbed down. And so some of the things that it could answer really good in 3.5. So for example, I was asking it some real estate questions and it came back about the law and it came back and 
gave, gave very good answers to that. In four, it tends to say, go consult a human expert. And I'm kind of like, why, why am I talking to a computer if it's just going to turn around and say, go compute, you know, go ask a lawyer, go ask a CPA, go ask, you know, whatever, without being able to give me some advice. And so I was kind of a little bit frustrated with that. Um, and, and one of the things that is kind of, I, I realized that I needed more control. You know, enterprises needed security around, you know, what they were doing so that they weren't leaking out, you know, confidential intellectual property um, out, out to chat GPT that was going to get chained up or you know, trained on, you know, what they were inputting and, you know, be, be publicly available. They also needed more control. So I was writing on, you know, working on a couple of applications, but I realized if the underlying model is changing, then, then that's really problematic because they don't have stability in the services. So I started working more with these open source models. You know, Llama 2 is out and stuff like that. Been working with Hugging Face, being able to train my own models. I've been collecting a bunch of data, which is relevant to the topics that I'm interested in so that I can do some, some training on, on these models and stuff like that. And, you know, it's really interesting to hear the conversation that's going on today about, you know, building these personal AIs. And I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, technical aspects of, you know, how each person is going to be able to, to train this AI and do that. So, you know, looking forward to, you know, being able to contribute and see what everybody else got to say. So thank you. Thank, thanks, Shad. Appreciate that. Looking forward to uh, chatting about this stuff in the uh, in the Slack chat here. Uh, three more folks for some introductions. We'll do a quick wrap up. Uh, we're about nine minutes left, uh, so if y'all can uh, take a look at maybe about two minutes each, I'll give Reza one more to uh, wrap up and uh, send us on our way. Uh, Oche, oh, excuse me, James, you were up next. Hi, another Toby acolyte sent here. I'll be brief and great panel, but great to talk here. I'm a fan, as I think most of us are, of fiction, particularly the sci-fi genre, and I would say that it really has for decades led probably a good portion of people online and a good portion of young fans and other people who are not here into the understanding of what prompts uh, commands such as Jet, Jet GPP. Any fan of a Star Trek franchise from the earliest days to the ones that are out today is very familiar with what kind of technologists we're describing here today. And they're actually, the citizen programmer is an, is an excellent where place to look for where not only new ideas come from, but also implementation. Um, you know, whether it's, and I'm speaking strictly in fiction terms for a moment, whether it's, you know, Zachary Coffrin uh, creating a rocket on his own, or back in the 70s when Disney had a few, or pre-Disney, when had a few television shows, or ABC when it talks about some, you know, retired NASA scientist creates a rocket ship. I mean, whether it's Two, when uh, people were building hot rods back in the 50s and 60s, or we had 200 car manufacturers who at one time operating just out of the U.S. Citizen power over technology is not a new thing. What we're looking at is more of its lead down where this could go. And I think what the power this group perhaps provides with these different groups are sort of a guidance and sort of a, to lead to where uh, some milestones where a lot of this energy and innovation could look to for guidance, not only from an innovation point of view, from a societal point of view. Uh, my two cents. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. Uh, Oche, you have a few minutes here. You, you're on mute if you're trying to speak here. And we'll go off, uh, we'll go over to uh, Laura. And uh, Oche, we'll come back to you if uh, if you come off here. Hint, hit me up in the chat. Laura. Also on mute. <laughs> okay, can I speak? Oh, there you are, Oche. Go ahead. All right. Uh, great day from here. My name is Oche Patry from Nigeria. Um, Reza uh, invited me here. We, we met at the conference last week, and he spoke about this vision. Although my background in AI is not um, so strong, but I'm committed to to, to these visions. Uh, having used some of the uh, AI platforms, and uh, see what it can do. And um, I'm wondering uh, the place of the human, of human in uh, going forward, and uh, with all these um, uh, AI AI uh, developments. And uh, I look at it, okay, uh, even though I'm not, um, my background is not so strong in AI, um, 
being committed. I'm ready to learn anything uh, around it. Uh, my background is around co consulting and training, uh, over 22 years of um, consulting and training. And so it will be difficult to, you know, get along. And also um, having understand a fair uh, idea about what AI can do and uh, the place of human, uh, a lot of them, um, if it's allowed to go, uh, without the visions like this, um, you know, Africa will be, be the worst hit. You know, mm. both those living in Africa and Africans in uh, uh, in diaspora. So, um, it's a good call. Uh, bringing on board uh, some other skills around maybe mobilize, mobilizing voices for this cause and, um, and see how we can um, get along together. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm glad to be here. Welcome, and, and thank you for, for representing the other side of the world here. I uh, really appreciate that. Laura, uh, and then uh, finally, Pinar. Hi, everyone. I've focused on, Laura Goodrich, I've focused on change and emerging technologies for 29 years this month, um, more specifically on um, you know, emerging technologies and how it impacts people and how to create that um, adoption of those technologies. And often when I'm presenting, people would say, you know, Laura, there's a negative and a positive side of this. And I, I always said there, there's a positive and negative side of everything. Have you ever had a teenager um, and, or been pecked to death by chickens? Um, but you know, this is an important discussion and I'm infinitely interested in sharing both the positive and exciting side of this as well as the risks. So um, I'll never tire of, of the discussion. I hope I can find a place to contribute to it and I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Welcome. Uh, Pinar, uh, let's uh, end it the list with you and uh, I'll kick it back over to uh, to Ray to wrap it up. Hi, so this is Punar. Afshin introduced me to this uh, group. And uh, so my background is more in medicine and I've also done in some research in imaging. Um, so one of the things that I'm interested in, yes, there's a lot of discussions about how uh, AI may um, replace humans. And of course this will happen, but uh, there's still a lot of jobs where we need humans. So I think what is more important that at least I believe we need to focus on is how we can retrain uh, humans um, to, to to shift to new um, type of jobs. Even I myself is now I'm retraining. I'm trying to learn more about AI, more about coding. Um, so more than trying to um, block uh, the use of AI uh, with the fear that it may replace what a human can do, I think let's just try to. Um, re-educate re um, uh, maybe with through micro education programs uh, people and try to help them to integrate uh, AI to their daily life and their jobs or even new jobs. Um, so that's one of the things. And ChatGPT is, is the one example uh, that even in healthcare, now it started to more direct people to humans um, and, and ChatGPT 3.5 was more giving the direct answer, which was very helpful. And now it's saying, okay, please consult uh, a human. And I think this is unnecessary because if it has the answer, it's better that I get the answer and then I try to in integrate it to my daily flow. Um, and yeah, so that's my main goal to be here. Wonderful. Thank you, Pinar. Welcome. Uh, well, what what a fantastic call today. Thank you. Uh, Riza, would you, uh, I don't know if you're available still, say a few words to wrap us yeah. up today? Okay, so um, thank you so much. Wow, what a, what a fantastic... Um, uh, call today. Um, look, we've heard a, a, a wide spectrum of of uh, diverse voices from around the the whole domain of AI and ethical AI, and um, we've we've spanned the gamut. All of these conversations we should not drop. These become working sessions within the organization, allow us to move that conversation forward in practical ways, rather than just fretting about the angst we feel about AI. Um, this is a call to action and it's a practical call to action. Don't mourn, mobilize. Don't um, just fret and write blog posts, organize. And so this is what Quai is all about. 
I'm so glad you're all on here. And I'm so glad that we've also got um, representation from around the world. That, that keynote that I gave to a, the Singaporean um, Conference uh, Global Skills Development Council actually brought in a, a, a bunch of members from from the other side of the world, and um, uh, you know there's there's a good chance that we we create chapters in different time zones so that these sorts of meetings can happen um, locally as well. Um, Matt, you were saying you were glad to hear voices from the other side of the world. I was born in Cape Town in South Africa, so it's fantastic to see fellow Africans on the call. And I think we need to get a, um, uh, a chapter um, uh, in Africa, a chapter in, in, in Asia Pacific as well. And um, so, look, this is the sixth call, only the sixth call we've had in this young organization, and we've already got momentum. Um, we're heading towards um, a face-to-face -face summit uh, maybe mid October, and um, we've we've got fantastic inbound interest from um, other conferences for us to speak at, but but from enterprises who want to actually have a seat at the table, and um, it's those enterprises that are actually going to fund our um, lab work. Um, so thanks so much, Matt. Thanks for um, organising this, but I want to thank all the. Um, the, the members of the advisory board, um, the, <laughs> the Slack channel is just blowing up. So look, any of you that are on the call and you haven't signed up at um, quai.ai, please do so. Um, and then Matt will get you onto the Slack channel and you can start participating in the conversation midweek. Thanks so much.